Welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Dr. Jayadeep Shorangi, Associate Professor of English, Jogesh Chandra Choudhury College, University of Calcutta, Kolkata. We are into Module 31, Christopher Marlowe, Temple Line. This module is written by Professor Bisheshwar Chakraborty, who teaches English at Jharam Raj College, Government, West Bengal. Friends, we have been discussing about the growth and development of English drama in the early Elizabethan period. We have had discussions on university wits and their contribution. Christopher Marlowe stands out as the leading figure among the university wits in England. His plays like the temple in the great Dr. Faustus, Edward II, Jew of Malta are pronounced plays and contributions by the university wits in the early part of the Elizabethan period. Today, we are going to learn about Temple Line the Great written by Christopher Marlowe. Friends, Christopher Marlowe's Temple Line the Great is a play in two parts. It is loosely based on the life of the central Asian emperor called Toimur, the Lame. Composed in the year 1587 or 88, the play is a landmark in the Elizabethan public drama. It signals a drifting away from the clumsy language and loose plotting of the early part of the Tudor playwrights. Therefore, Tamburlaine the Great has, a, has, a, has an important role in the context of the university wits. Out of the existing plays by the university wits of the time, Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy, Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, the contributions are enormous. Now, about Tamburlaine, nothing is more characteristic of Marlowe than the choice of his first hero. Perhaps his heroes are magnanimous more than life. If we think of Dr. Faustus as a tragic protagonist or Barabbas as the most important character in the Jew of Malta, Tamburlaine is also an important character who dreams of world conquest. As a product of the Renaissance, Tamburlaine aspires for knowledge, grasping power and control over space and time. Perhaps, he had gone through a translation of Tamburlaine's life by the Spaniard Padre Maxima, another life of his Padreus of Florence. His imagination was then kindled by the story of the career of his unmatched adventurer, who from a mere shepherd became the most proud and powerful man in the universe. There was no need to invent, to follow history or legend in the guise of authentic history was enough. Therefore, some critics considered the play as a historical text. Now, publication. The play in both parts was registered to the stationer's register on 14th August 1590 as under two comic discourses. Both parts came in print together in a single black letter octave that in the same year by the printer Richard Jones. Its text is usually referred to as 01. A second edition was issued by Jones in 1592 and a third reprint emerged in 1597. Essentially reprinting the text of the first edition, the plays were next published separately in quattro 
by the bookseller Edward White, part 1 in the year 1605 and part 2 in 1606, which represent, uh, reprinted the text of the 1597 edition. Now, some discussions about the play. The play, as we said earlier, is Merleau's first powerful creation. The general chorus of warm welcome which greeted the play on its first presentation on stage in the year 1587, it, which encouraged Merleau to paint his second part. The very subject matter and style of Timberline heralded a strikingly novel, enthrallingly publishing important category of book, book, the powerful dramatic manifesto. From jiggling veins of rhythm, motor, mother wits and such conceits that clownage keeps in pay, we all lead you to the stately tent of war, where you shall hear the Scythian Timberline threatening the world with high astounding terms and scourging kingdoms with his conquering sword. With these lines, you can really understand the aspirations of Timberline the Great. Timberline is the most resplendent of Marlowe's plays in which the morning stirs of poetry and imagination of rhythm together. It is a story of a Scythian shepherd who dares of a dream of world conquest and achieves his aspiration marvelously. As a drama, it has many drawbacks, it has to be, because this is a part of early theatrical tradition in England. The plot is to some extent weak and the connections are often loose. The design seems to be lacking in of a, of a master artist, sometimes abstract, the effects are grim and sometimes bloody. Yet, who can refrain from appraising the play as a first rate taking into account the attractive exaggeration or attractive presentation of thought and expression? The burning passages, the exquisite poetry are hallmark of the text. There are some other elements which dazzle in the text. One thing is sure the luminous coloring of Marlovian discourse, the power of motif. In the foremost of all these, the towering high above all stands of high tempted hero, all indomitable strength and passionate speech, Tamberlane is the presentation or the symbol of invincible man, the man who can never be conquered of. It is filled of fritted and fuming aspirations of the age. He shows the temper of the Renaissance man. Youthful poets dream on summer eves by haunted stream. In the character of the hero is enshrined and illustrated man's desire and valiance that range all circumstance and come to port unspent. Still climbing after knowledge infinite, Timberline bust rides the world like a medieval Napoleon in accordance with the titanic strides and triumphs of the supermen are Scythian, horses which sweeps wide spaces of uncivilized, splendor swept and sparkling movements. Friends, with these lines we can move to some of the pronounced themes of the play. The play is like to a representation of Renesha humanism, which idealizes the potential of human beings. Timberline uh, aspires for enormous power, power that can control even the universe. The religious issues he thinks about, the scourges of God, and some readers have linked this position with the fact of Merlot was blamed of 
atheism because he is going against God and manipulating all power for himself. Jeb Daly remarks in his article Christian un underscore underscoring in Tamberline the Great Part 1 that Marlowe's work is a direct successor to the tradition of medieval morality plays that whether or not he is an atheist it is it is a fact that the techniques used in the play are beyond doubt and beyond all perspectives and fronts. Friends, the performance of the play. The first part of Templeine was performed by the Admiral's men late in the year 1587. Around a year after Marlowe's departure from Cambridge University, Edward Elvin performed the role of Templeine, and it apparently became one of his signature roles. The play's reputation significant enough to prompt Marlowe to produce the sequel. The EL's Dramatic Association staged a Timberline, which edited and combined both parts of Marlowe's play. A revival, both parts in condensed form, was presented at Old Vic in September 15, 1951 with Donald Wolf in the title role. Royal National Theatre production in the year 1976 featured Albert Finney in the title role and the production opened the view and uh, new Oliver Theatre in the South Bank Peter Hall directed. This production is generally considered the most successful of the rare modern productions. So, if we just look into the performances of the play, there is a whole legacy of it. Now, what is the impact of the play? Why is Timberline the Great so important? And even nowadays, we include in the syllabi. The influence of Timberline on the, on the playwriting tradition of 1590s is remarkable. The play typified in some cases shaped many distinctive characteristics of the high Elizabethan drama, verbose and often dazzling imagery, hyperbolic expression and burly characteristic stimulated by awe-inspiring passions. But the first recorded remarks on the play are negative. A letter written in 1587 speaks about the account of a child being killed by the accidental release of a fire stream during the presentation. The next year, Robert Greene, in the course of an attack on Marlowe, scoffs an aesthetic timber line. In, epi in Epistle to Primbids in Blacksmith, the most playgoers with the playwrights responded with the gusto to thoroughly recognize the increase of Asian directors and aspiring minds in the drama of the 1590s. Marlowe's influence on many characters in Shakespeare's history plays has been discerned by among them the Stephen Greenblatt considers it likely that Timberline was among the first London plays that Shakespeare witnessed, an experience that directly motivated him to write Henry VI plays. So, that means Timberline the Great has enormous importance on William Shakespeare and the playwrights to come. Friends, to conclude, in this particular module, we have read, understood some salient features about Timberline the Great written by Christopher Marlowe. Our intention was to place Timberline the Great in the context of the early Elizabethan theatre or in the context of revenge plays under and written by the university waits. I hope now your understanding about the sentiments, tempo of the time in connection with Timberline the Great has enriched you enormously. Friends, don't go home without seeing the hyperlinks on the screen. The first part of Timberline the Great.
by Christopher Marlowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introduction read by Martin Giessen. Tamburlaine the Great, who from a Scythian shepherd, by his rare and wonderful conquests, became a most puissant and mighty monarch, and for his tyranny and terror in war was termed the Scourge of God, divided into two tragical discourses as they were sundry times showed upon stages in the city of London by the right honourable the lord admiral his servants now first and newly published london printed by richard jones at the sign of the rose and crown near holborn bridge a thousand five hundred ninety quarto the above title page is pasted into a copy of the first part of Tamburlaine in the library at Bridgewater House, which copy, excepting that title page and the address to the readers, is the impression of 1605. I once supposed that the title pages which bear the dates 1605 and 1606, see below, had been added to the quartos of the two parts of the play originally printed in 1590, but I am now convinced that both parts were really reprinted, the first part in 1605 and the second part in 1606, and that nothing remains of the earlier quartos except the title page and the address to the readers, which are preserved in the Bridgewater collection. In the Bodleian Library, Oxford, is an octavo edition of both parts of Tamburlaine, dated 1590. The title page of the first part agrees verbatim with that given above. The half-title page of the second part is as follows. The second part of the bloody conquests of mighty Tamburlaine with his impassionate fury for the death of his lady and love fair xenocrate his form of exhortation and discipline to his three sons and the manner of his own death in the garrick collection british museum is an octavo edition of both parts dated fifteen ninety two the title page of the first part runs thus Tamburlaine the Great, who from a Scythian shepherd, by his rare and wonderful conquests, became a most puissant and mighty monarch, sick, and for his tyranny and terror in war, was termed the Scourge of God. The first part of the two tragical discourses, as they were sundry times most stately showed upon stages in the city of London by the right honourable the lord admiral his servants now newly published printed by richard jones dwelling at the sign of the rose and crown near holborn bridge the half-title page of the second part agrees exactly with that already given perhaps the octavo at oxford and that in the british museum for i have not had an opportunity of comparing them are the same impression differing only in the title pages langbane account of english dramatic poets page three hundred and forty four mentions an octavo dated fifteen ninety three the title pages of the latest impressions of the two parts are as follows tamburlaine the great who from a state of a shepherd in scythia by his rare and wonderful conquests became a most puissant and mighty monarch london printed for edward white and are to be sold at the little north door of st paul's church at the sign of the gun a thousand six hundred five quarto tamburlaine the great 
with his impassionate fury for the death of his lady and love fair Xenocrate, his form of exhortation and discipline to his three sons, and the manner of his own death. The second part. London, printed by E. A. for Ed White, and are to be sold at his shop near the little north door of St. Paul's Church at the sign of the gun. A thousand six hundred six. Quarto. The text of the present edition is given from the octavo of 1592, collated with the quartos of 1605 to 6. End of Introduction Dedication Read by Martin Giessen Well met, my only dear Xenocrate, though with the loss of Egypt and my crown. "'Twas I, my lord, that gat the victory, and therefore grieve not at your overthrow, since I shall render all into your hands, and add more strength to your dominions than ever yet confirmed the Egyptian crown. The god of war resigns his room to me, meaning to make me general of the world. Jove, viewing me in arms, looks pale and wan, fearing my power should pull him from his throne. Where'er I come, the fatal sisters sweat, and grisly death, by running to and fro to do their ceaseless homage to my sword. And here in Afric, where it seldom rains, since I arrived with my triumphant host, have swelling clouds drawn from wide gaping wounds been oft resolved in bloody purple showers, a meteor that might terrify the earth and make it quake at every drop it drinks. Millions of souls sit on the banks of Styx, waiting the back return of Charon's boat. Hell and Elysium swarm with ghosts of men that I have sent from sundry foughten fields to spread my fame through hell and up to heaven. And see, my lord, a sight of strange import. Emperors and kings lie breathless at my feet. The Turk and his great empress, as it seems, left to themselves while we were at the fight, have desperately dispatched their slavish lives. With them Arabia, too, hath left his life. All sights of power to grace my victory, and such are objects fit for Tamburlaine, wherein, as in a mirror, may be seen his honour that consists in shedding blood when men presume to manage arms with him. Mighty hath God and Mahomet made thy hand, renowned Tamburlaine, to whom all kings of force must yield their crowns and emperies. And I am pleased with this my overthrow, if, as beseems a person of thy state, thou hast with honour us, Xenocrate. Her state and person want no pomp, you see. And for all blot of foul in chastity, I record heaven, her heavenly self is clear. Then let me find no further time to grace her princely temples with the Persian crown. But here, these kings, that on my fortunes wait, and have been crowned for proved worthiness, even by this hand that shall establish them, shall now, adjoining all their hands with mine, invest her here the queen of Persia. What saith the noble Soldan and Xenocrate? I yield with thanks and protestations of endless honour to thee for her love. Then doubt I not, but fair Xenocrate will soon consent to satisfy us both. Else should I much forget myself, my lord. Then let us set the crown upon her head, that hath long lingered for so high a seat. My hand is ready to perform the deed, for now her marriage time shall work us rest. And here's the crown, my lord, help set it on. Then sit thou down, divine Xenocrate, and here we crown thee Queen of Persia, and all the kingdoms and dominions that late the power of Tamburlaine subdued. As Juno, when the giants were suppressed, that darted mountains at her brother Jove, so looks my love, shadowing in her brows triumphs and trophies for my victories. Or as Latona's daughter, bent to arms, adding more courage to my conquering mind. To gratify thee, sweet Xenocrate, 
Egyptians, Moors, and men of Asia, from Barbary unto the western India, shall pay a yearly tribute to thy sire, and from the bounds of Africa to the banks of Ganges shall his mighty arm extend. And now, my lords and loving followers, that purchased kingdoms by your martial deeds, cast off your armor, put on scarlet robes, mount up your royal places of estate, environed with troops of noblemen, and there make laws to rule your provinces. Hang up your weapons on Alcides' posts, for Tamburlaine takes truce with all the world. Thy first betrothed love, Arabia, shall we with honor, as beseems, entomb with this great Turk and his fair empress. Then, after all these solemn exequies, we will our rites of marriage solemnize. <laughs>